So we're finishing up uh, the apostolicity of the Catholic Church. We're on a, an objection. Um, the objection is that the monuments of the first centuries, by the way, monument uh, does not refer only to a stone monument. Uh, in academia, it refers to early documents. It's a monument. Right, so the monuments of the first century show that the church of those times is quite different from the Roman church, therefore the church is not apostolic. Um, and they claim that the church had an abhorrence for a multitude of dogmas, so, which is just totally false. But response, I distinguish the antecedent that this difference is substantial, I deny accidental. So that's a very important point, that the church does go through accidental changes, uh, but not substantial changes. And the whole question of Vatican II is, is it an accidental change or a substantial change? No one in his right mind would deny that there have been changes. <laughs> All right, so the, the question is, are they accidental or substantial? If they're accidental, then there's no objection to them. No intrinsic objection. You could say they might be prudent or imprudent, but there's no intrinsic objection to them possible. If they are substantial, then there's a whole other. <laughs> that means they're a defection from the Catholic faith. And they're one or the other. Every change in nature is either accidental or substantial. And every change, uh, analogically speaking, as in moral changes, are uh, accidental or substantial. The adversaries object both immutability and the changes which they say are very great in the Roman Church. But the substance of the church is entirely immutable. So this is the response. In accidental things, however, and with regard to conclusions from principles, and in regard to their application, there is a certain progress admitted by the Catholics themselves. So certain disciplines, for example. Uh, I think some, somewhere uh, in the Middle Ages, because um, there was some denial of... Uh, the uh, I forget the, the the church wanted communion under both species in, in order to overcome some heresy that was denying something about it, and then when the Protestants insisted on communion under both species, the church said no, we don't want communion under both species. There could be disciplinary changes like that in order to combat heresies. Only in this way is there a difference between the early church and the present state of the church. St. Thomas says the church is the same numero. That means it's the same thing. So it's to be the same numero means that you don't have two different things. Which was then and now is because the faith is the same and the sacraments of the faith are the same and there is the same authority and the same profession. See, so that makes one institution both juridical and, uh, what would you say, um, with regard to its faith and practices. For this reason, the, the apostle says in 1 Corinthians, is Christ divided? This is repugnant. There is a different state of the church now and then, but there is not a different church. That's in the Quod Libertalis. So that, that's the central question on, in Vatican II. It's a central question. So let us come to the proof of the antecedent. The primitive church had an abhorrence for a multitude of dogmas I distinguish for the dogmas of the false brethren I concede, for the dogmas of Christ I deny. The dogmas of the church were always the same. As doubts and errors emerged, however, the truth was more explicitly proposed and more solemnly declared. <clears throat> so you, uh, and when there's a heresy, you look at the dogmas more carefully and you expose them more and solemnly declare them more. 
That's all it is. St. Paul says heresies must occur in order to prove the faith of, of the faithful. That's the reason for heresies. This was done in order to take care of the faithful, lest the false brethren re remove them from the simplicity which is in Christ. Instance, the ancients were immune to the influence and dominance of the hierarchy. I distinguish in the early centuries one does not see the same power of the hierarchy and primacy with regard to right, I deny, with regard to the use of the right, I concede. So because of the difficulty in communication and you know Rome was a long way from Antioch and it was a long way from England and a long way from France it still is it's just that communications are all different now and modes of transportation are different so the ability of Rome to govern the entire church was more difficult we might say than it is now or even in the 19th century so but the the right was there so in early times, power was not exercised in all of its uses, since the uses had to be moderated according to the condition of the time. So it was true in the Middle Ages. You know, it, it took forever for a letter to get from Rome to, to Paris. <laughs> it took forever. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the famous case of that the Battle of... New Orleans took place after the treaty was signed in Ghent in Belgium in the War of 1812. A few weeks afterwards, the, the Americans signed a very humiliating treaty with the English in the city of Ghent in Belgium as, uh, as the end of the War of 1812. And in the meantime, well, <laughs> a few weeks after, there was this big battle in uh, Louisiana the Battle of New Orleans, where the English were totally trounced. And uh, that would have changed the whole outcome of the, of the treaty, but in any case. So, it, you know, things, things of that nature happened, you know, so there were delays. So we have already shown in question three, however, that the hierarchical power itself was in the church from the beginning. So there are many cases of, of papal interventions and and the papal legates being sent to councils, etc. So, I mean, it's not as if the papacy uh, usurped uh, rights as it went along. It's, it, it exercised its rights more efficaciously as, as conditions permitted. Instance, the primitive practice was completely simple in which it, was, it is certain that there were neither the veneration of the Virgin Mary nor... Uh, the invocation of the saints, nor the use of relics, nor other things of this type which dishonor the Roman church. Response, I distinguish the ancients did not know the veneration of this type, I deny. They did not know certain ways of venerating, I concede. The ancients at no time were ignorant of the fact that the saints who were enjoying eternal happiness should be invoked nor do we find that it was forbidden to them to honor the bodies which were the temples of the Holy Ghost by means of a certain veneration. See, so you see uh, the bodies of martyrs being recovered and, and venerated. That's, that's the early church. This is proven by dogmatic theologians and by the very ancient monuments of archaeology. On the other hand, there is no doubt that some of the ways of worshiping, such as associations of the Blessed Virgin Mary, were not seen in the early church. So it's definitely true that the, uh, the, the way, and perhaps the, you might say the attention given to the Blessed Virgin Mary has increased over the ages. But that's normal because the church contemplates its own treasures. But that doesn't mean it was non-existent. I mean, there's plenty of, of texts in St. Jerome and in others, uh, you know, referring to the Blessed Virgin Mary. <clears throat> but we, could not, we should not consider these ways of venerating to be a new and evil superstition. For it is proper to Catholic truth that in due time, like a heavenly garden, it brings forth new fruits of pious exercises. So the devotion to St. Joseph, for example. 
pretty much 19th century, maybe early, late 18th century. I mean, no one was against St. Joseph, <laughs> obviously, but the devotion to him sprang up during that time. That you, you had devotion to the Sacred Heart. <clears throat> See that starting with St. Gertrude, you know, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, St. Gertrude, but you don't see, at least you don't have evidence for that particular way of worshiping Christ before that la latter part of the Middle Ages. It's because the church contemplates the, the enormous, I'll just say, the positive faith and the enormous richness of the faith and and so as time you know as as saints think about them and write about them these things become you might say more popular our adversaries are ignorant of the law of development of which we will speak later so it's like a tree that grows there is a homogeneous development and again, that's the, the whole question of Vatican II, and that's where you start with somebody. Is, is Vatican II a homogeneous development of the Catholic faith? Homogeneous, that means the same genus. Homogeneous. Because there is plenty of homogeneous development in the Catholic faith. Or is it heterogeneous? So, yeah. In other words, is it a corruption? It's the whole question. All, everything else flows, all the other conclusions flow from the answer to that question. So that's where the, the battlefield is. Yes. Heterogeneous, you know, hetero and homo. In, uh, homo means same, hetero means different in Greek. The Greek root. Right. So homogenized milk, for example. So if you took Greek, you'd know it. You'd know it. You sign up for Greek, I'll get Father, uh, Father Fleece to teach it to you if you want. If you think Latin is bad. <laughs> so objection two. That is not apostolic which the apostles have not handed down, but many of the canons of the councils and of the pious exercises which the Roman Church admits have not been handed down to the church by the apostles. Ergo, response, I distinguish the major. That thing is not apostolic, which the apostles did not hand down with regard to faith in say, I concede, with regard to all of the explanations and applications of faith, I deny. <clears throat> From this, the response to the minor and the conclusion is evident. Because many have perverted the truth of the faith, it was necessary as St. Thomas Aquinas says, as times progressed, that there be an explanation of faith against insurgent errors. Nor can new exercises of piety be put in the category that they must be cons considered contrary to apostolicity, since it is licit that one and the same dogma be expressed in worship in various ways, just as one charity of God is manifested in various external forms. <clears throat> Instance, Cyrillus Lucar, the patriarch of Constantinople around the year 1625, promulgated a profession of faith in which these things are read. It is the perpetual and constant doctrine of the Greeks that there are only two sacraments, baptism and Eucharist, established by the Supreme Legislator Christ, Article 15. Therefore, the sacraments of the Roman Church are not apostolic. <clears throat> the, uh, 
the Orthodox were influenced by the Protestants. Response Cyril, a man who was convinced of Calvinist doctrines, composed a lie in this article. Nor was the lie not condemned in the entire East. George Coresius and Gregory Proto Sincellus condemned the fraud of Cyril. Three patriarchs, Cyril Beroensis, the Patriarch of Constantinople, Metrophanes of Alexandria, and Theophanes of Jerusalem, in a council held in Constantinople in 1638, anathematized Cyril, who believes that there are, not, uh, there are not, by apostolic tradition and by perpetual practice, seven sacraments of the church. The matter was finished when other councils of the Orientals were added to this. But the Protestants had a certain influence on the Orthodox. They all hated Rome, so they, you know, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Objection three, it was able to happen that new dogmas were formed by undetectable changes. Therefore, it seems that the apostolicity of the Roman church is uncertain. Response, I distinguish the antecedent that such a thing could happen in the abstract, let it pass, that it has happened in the con this concrete case, I deny. First of all, the Roman church proves by visible facts that it is the legitimate heir of the apostles. But a public and certain fact is not destroyed by possible and undetectable things. Finally, the Roman Church has always been vigilant that it observe tradition, so much so that its adversaries commonly call this constancy in the truth the Roman immobility. Furthermore, from the monuments which were already known and from others which were later found, such as in the catacombs, the image emerges which so truly represents the Church as it is today that many Protestants, especially in England, have been moved to return to the Roman faith by the study of antiquity, seeking the certain way of salvation, where they have noticed a continuation from the apostles and the integrity of dogmas. Newman said, to read the fathers is to be Catholic. He was converted by reading the fathers. He was a classics expert. So he read the Fathers in their original languages, and he said to read the Fathers is to be Catholic, and that is true. They are loaded with Catholicism. <clears throat> so now we get to question eight on the qualities of the church, the indefectibility and infallibility of the church. So this should be, yes. You have about four hours. <laughs> well, I, you know, again, I would say that you have the situation is this, you have a continuity of hierarchy, materialitaire, which is not doing its job of continuing the, let's say, the, what pertains to the, um, I'm trying to find the word, the invisible part of the church. In other words, it pertains to, uh, well, I shouldn't say invisible. Those, uh, the, the purpose of the, of the hierarchy is to promote the Catholic faith, Catholic sacraments, Catholic dogmas, everything. All right? That's their purpose. Just like the purpose of a bottle is to hold the wine. All right, so, so this is a, a vehicle, the hierarchy is a vehicle of promoting the ends of the church. All right, so I would say there's a continuity of mission in what we are doing. Normally, mission and hierarchy should be together, but they're not right now. So you have this, this 
corpse of a hierarchy. That's what Bishop Gerard called it. Uh, it's 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 like a dead body of a hierarchy, but it's nonetheless there. And and then you have a continuity of Catholics holding to the Catholic faith and displaying the 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 marks in that way, the unity of faith. Uh, the uh, uh, unity of m sacraments, etc., uh, ap apostolicity of doctrine and practices. Uh, one holy, ca it's Catholic in that sense. Wherever you find Catholics, you find traditional Catholics. Uh, and uh, one, and it's holy. They're they're following all of the the holy doctrines and practices of the Church. So I think you see it there. It's it's, and. Uh, um, so I, I, I think that's the problem. I think that you have a, a, because you have a material continuity of hierarchy, you have a single institution that has not died. So I would say there, there is your four marks. It has visibility in as much as you still have a single institution that has not died. That's why I think that's extremely important. <laughs> in other words, if you, if you just get rid of that, you have a, uh, how would you, you know, you have a movement or a, uh, a collection of, of Catholics, but you don't have a, a continuous church. No, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> no. There's visibility, yes. Yes, I would say so. I mean, the, the, there's no unity of faith in the Novus Ordo. If you consider that in its, the, the religion that they are promoting, there's no unity of faith, there's no apostolicity. There's no holiness, goodness knows. Uh, and therefore, no Catholicity because there's no unity. If it had those marks, we would join it. Well, don't forget that in the early uh, decades of the church, it was pretty few as well. I mean, you didn't have, you're thinking of the Catholic Church as it existed under Pius XII, which was enormous and which was spread everywhere, and including the islands of the Pacific. And, and you know, just uh, uh, the, um, no, I mean the the first decades of the church were, you know, had a, the church, I would say the church was pretty obscure. Even the the Romans thought that it was that the Christians were simply a sect of the Jews. That's how little visibility it had. But it, I mean, it had visibility, but it was not commonly seen and known to be uh, uh, a you know a church separate from the Jews. No, you know, it, it's, so I mean, it, it doesn't have to be enormous. It just has to have those qualities. It has to be able to be seen and known by those qualities. There are analogies, but you have to be very careful because the, there are many cases in which the analogy doesn't apply. There are certain cases in which it does, certain cases in which it doesn't. And I, I think it's um, dangerous to, to go there because you could easily make certain errors.
Well, the mystical body uh, refers to the the body of the church as it is mystically the body of Christ. I, I don't see what the problem is there. It is an institution who claims to be um, the, the official representative of this body, but it is not in fact. Well, you still have a continuity, a material continuity of the hierarchy, and in that, that sense, it's Catholic. In that sense, it's, put your hand down. In that sense, it's Catholic. They, they are in possession of the, the Catholic body of the hierarchy. They are in possession of it, just as if somebody stole your car or hijacked a plane. They're in possession of it. I mean, it's not an easy thing to figure out. It's a totally irregular situation, but God has permitted it for a certain reason. We don't know why. Uh, my theory is that it's in preparation for the Antichrist because you could not have had a great apostasy from the faith except if this had happened. As I said in another in the interview that I did, if they had gathered together and said, we're forming the modernist Catholic Church. We're breaking from Rome. We want nothing to do with Rome, and we're forming the modernist Catholic Church. It would have perhaps, you know, a thousand adherents in the whole world, and people would laugh at it, and life would have gone on very nicely in the Catholic Church while those idiots were doing crazy things, you know, in, in their own modernist Catholic Church. If they had done that, we would not be in this situation. But they were clever enough to, and they planned it. If you read their literature from the time of Pius X, they planned this to, to infiltrate and to, to get into positions of, of hierarchy and do this very thing. And people see the, the body more than they see the soul. You see, so they see the, that's the Catholic hierarchy. And they're telling us to do this, so we do it. And they think it's Catholic. And that's how you deceived a great many people. And you, you have a great apostasy from the faith. I mean, it's, I mean, yes, there are certain people in the Novus Order who still have the Catholic faith. They suffer as a result of having the Catholic faith because every time they go to church, they're sickened. So that, that's the, some people still retaining the virtue of faith. In, in the, but I would say most of them have defected from the faith. In my opinion, most of them have. Uh, you know, they're for abortion, they're for all sorts of horrible things, and they think you know, it's good that the church has changed and come around on these issues. That, that's heresy, that's the spirit of heresy. Because the Catholic faith is, is, is infused by God, and it would object to any substantial change in doctrine intrinsically, just as if I said two plus two is equal to five, your common sense of mathematics would say, oh no, that's impossible. See, and so the Catholic faith rebels at the idea of change in dogma. It's a virtue infused by God. It's not just some conviction. It rebels. No, that's impossible. And I think most Novus Ordo Catholics have long since abandoned that, and they're happy with the Novus Ordo. They have their annulments, they have all sorts of, they have Amoris Laetitia, you know. You can have your adultery and communion too. I'm, I don't know, I, the... I mean, I, I'm just saying this is the situation. You know, how it all uh, connects, uh, I'm not entirely sure, but I mean, that's the situation we have, is that continuity of the hierarchy in that sense, materially, and continuity of the mission of the church. You have that. The mission of the church does not die. They should be together, just like the wine should be in the bottle. But they're not together right now. So, I, I don't know if... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, in my, my question, actually, we could somehow compare our position with um, uh, society in the sense that they never, they never give the whole answer, they only make a half step saying, okay, we cannot say that the church disappeared. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, the mission here is purely by epikeia. It's per modum actus. I mean, there's no general or habitual mission that we have. I'm just saying that de facto life is going on. The, the Catholic life is, can be, is being continued. But it's not any kind of, uh, you know, official thing or you know, habitual mission. No. It's like the priests in the forests uh, of Vendée. You know, it's pretty much like that. Um, so, uh, any other? Yeah. Your Excellency, what are some of the dangers you went to by making the analogy of the soul and the body? Well, you have the fact that Christ truly died. <laughs> you see? And you don't want to say that the church has died. <laughs> See, that's a bad analogy. That's one of the things right off the bat. So, you know, so, uh, I never make the analogy because I, I think it's, it's a minefield. You know, you'd have to so carefully work your way through it that you could blow up. I guess it's better to avoid it. Yes. No. We're a group in society of the faithful. I, uh, I would say that you have a, there's a visibility of institution in the Novus Ordo. The, the institution of the Catholic Church has not died. I would say that. That's visible. Yes. Yeah, well, I would say that we adhere to, first of all, we're saying that that is materially a visible hierarchy, and in that sense, there's a certain adherence to it, right? And we adhere to the authority of the church in principle. In other words, that give us a, a pope, we'll submit to him. In other words, there is a, that, that disposition to, it's not as if we are separating in any way from the institution of the Catholic Church. I, th I think it's there. Don't forget, these theologians that said all these things had no idea that this was going to happen. I mean, if you had told them back in 1642 that you were going to see this happen, they would have laughed. They would say, God would not permit it. Bio even says God would not permit a heretical pope because of all of the chaos that would ensue from it. Many others say that. But he did say if it, it did happen, definitely he would not be the pope. So, you know, you have to uh, you know, apply the principles with a certain, I would just say, uh, adaptation to the situation. I mean, you, you're, you're not going to get a model like they're talking about. Not in this situation. But I mean, you can identify Catholics in the world. I mean, even Novus Ordo Catholics have not legally been detached from the Catholic Church. Institutionally, they're not they are still part of the Catholic Church, institutionally. Despite what some may say.
<laughs> See? But, you know, you're going to definitely read things that uh, where they would ex have excluded this possibility entirely. But what is, what is an old saying, what exists is possible. If it exists, it is possible. And it exists, therefore it's possible. All right, so uh, do your best to figure it out. But that, that's, I mean, I, to me, that, that's what we're living, is, is a, a disconnect of those two things. Everybody's staring, thinking. <laughs> you can put that in the video, staring, thinking. <laughs> so, you know, uh, that's, uh, but it's important that, you know, at least you have some explanation for it. Uh, 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 there was uh, uh, there appeared in, in a certain bulletin uh, this past Sunday that the church is apostolic by itself. Uh, we don't have to do anything about it. I mean, that doesn't work. So. All right. Whether the church is indefectible. The definition of indefectibility. Indefectibility is the quality or property of the church given to the church by Christ by which it will remain in that unchanged state until the end of time just as Christ has founded it. All right. So the definition includes the existence of the church never to be interrupted. That's why I say you can't say the church has died to the identity of being in regard to all things which pertain to the essence of the church. Three, the perennial visibility of the church since we have proven that that visibility pertains to the essence of the church. All right, so you have the continuity of institution and the continuity of its doctrines, sacraments, and everything that pertains to its mission. That's indefectibility. So this is a very important subject because, again, it goes back to Vatican II. If Vatican II is giving us a different religion, then you, that affects indefectibility. And obviously the most important element in that is the doctrinal continuity because the jurisdictional or juridical continuity is the, exists for the doctrinal continuity and the continuity of sacraments, etc. It exists for that. It has no other reason for existence than that. But what is not excluded is, one, the progress of men in believing, explaining, and scientifically declaring the law of Christ. So there is a development of doctrine in that sense, making explicit what is implicit. Two, the changes of those things which the Savior in particular left to the church to determine, such as certain times of fasting, etc. Indefectibility is called by some perpetuity. So some of the older authors will call it the perpetuity of the church. The opinions of the adversaries. We pass over the obsolete opinion of the Donatists who claim that the Catholicity of the church has defected which is to indirectly say that the church is, itself has defected. The naturalists 
and the rationalists, if they attribute anything to the immortality of the church, it is certainly no different than what they attribute to Mohammedans. You know, it continues just like Mohammedanism continues or Buddhism continues along. It's just there. Voltaire, David Strauss, uh, Edvard von Hartmann, and you can see, uh, uh, and men who consider themselves very cultured nearly all hold that the Catholic Church will be destroyed and that it is near to its destruction. The Protestants assert, A, that it is possible that the church, either for a time or even perpetually, admit errors contrary to revealed faith. By such an opinion, they directly undermine infallibility. Well, I have to say that because until 1517, you know, the church was off the rails. And also the church for them is comes from underneath. You see, it's an invisible church. And the church, the institutional church, is something that is constituted and made by individual believers. See, so it's not, the institution of the church does not come from Christ. It comes from below. In other words, people come together uh, and form local churches, and then they form uh, groups of churches and the Missouri Synod of the Lutherans, you see, that all it's all human. So sure, they could make a mistake. B, they contend that the church is defectible and in fact did defect before Luther. In reality, they do not affirm it absolutely, but they say, say Robert Bellarmine says, that it must be understood concerning the visible church. <clears throat> the firm opinion of some Protestants seems to be that declared rather openly by Calvin that God has effected by his providence that besides baptism other relics have also survived lest the church perish completely but in the same way that buildings fall down and there remain foundations and ruins so God did not permit that his church be subverted by the Antichrist, that means the Pope, from the foundation, or that it be equal with the ground, but he wanted that from that devastation there survive a semi-ruined building. building. <clears throat> they had to somehow explain the fact that until 1517, things were really bad. <clears throat> Kennel, who was a Jansenist, claimed that there were very evident signs of the old age of the church. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the diocesan synod of Pistoia contended that in these last centuries there has been spread about a general darkening concerning truths of more serious importance <coughs> relating to religion which are the basis of the faith and moral doctrine of Jesus Christ. This proposition was condemned as heretical by Pius VI in the Constitution Auctorum Fide, the 28th of August, 1794. <clears throat> so, Thesis, the church is indefectible. Argument one from sacred scripture, the prophecies of the Old Testament, the promises of Christ in, and his parables and institutions indicate an indefectible church. Therefore, the church of Christ is indefectible, proof of the antecedent. A, the prophecies, the prophecies repeatedly announce the reign of Christ and of David through Christ, which will remain forever. Uh, Daniel 2, 44. For we read, he shall sit upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to establish it and st strengthen it with judgment and with justice from henceforth and forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. 
you know, something else that I should mention is part of the indefectibility of the church is the rejection of those men as popes. Because if the church, meaning those who profess the Catholic faith, were to accept those men as popes, you have a defection. That is intrinsic in the, in the reaction of Catholics. As Father Barbara said, they have to be unmasked for what they are, these people. That's why the Society of St. Pius X in trying to be part of the, the you know, some sort of uh, branch of the Novus Ordo is, is very seriously wrong. That's what they're looking for, as if that's a solution. And that's why uh, unicum is very important. It's not merely, you know, well, it's a nice mass, but the priest is saying something wrong, and he shouldn't really do that. Uh, it's a very important thing not to profess unicum. Uh, Isaiah says, And I will make an everlasting covenant with them, and will not cease to do them good, and I will give my fear in their heart, that they may not revolt from me. <clears throat> Jeremiah said, He gave him power and glory and a kingdom, and all peoples, tribes, and tongues shall serve him. His power is an everlasting power that shall not be taken away, and his kingdom that shall not be destroyed. 